Our next speaker is Ron Spronk. Ron Spronk is a professor of art history at Queen's University with a special interest in paintings, materials, and techniques. He studies the genesis of easel paintings from Van Eyck to Mondrian with techniques such as infrared reflectography and x-radiography. Originally from the Netherlands, he moved to the US to pursue a PhD from Indiana University Bloomington. Before coming to Queens in 2007, he worked at the Harvard Art Museums for 13 years where he undertook several inter interdisciplinary projects um, in research and exhibition. And in addition to his professorship at Queens, Ron Spronk is al also holds the Hieronymus Bosch Chair at Ravult University in the Netherlands and is currently participating in the Bosch Research and Conservation Project, which will result in a major exhibition and new monograph. He's also closely involved, you notice a lot of also's, he's got a lot of irons in the fire here. He's also closely involved in the current conservation restoration treatment of the Ghent altarpiece, for which he coordinated the innovative online research tool called Closer to Van Eyck. And I understand there will be demos of both of these projects at the reception today. At Queens, he is currently establishing a mobile laboratory for technical art history. Please help me welcome Ron Spunk. I will focus my short presentation today on uh, two of my uh, current three projects. So we'll be, I'll be talking about uh, mostly about Closer to Van Eyck and then briefly on the, uh, the Bosch project, uh, the BRCP. Uh, in addition to that, there's also another current big project on Bruegel, which will, uh, in relation to a big exhibition that will open in 2018 in Vienna. Uh, but one has to pick when you only have 15, 15 minutes. Uh, Netherlands paintings uh, typically have uh, the same structure. Um, paintings on panel, that is. And uh, you have a, a panel substrate, a panel support, typically Baltic oak, on which there's a white ground layer. Um, on top of that ground layer, very importantly, is an underdrawing, which, where the artist sketches his composition. Uh, on top of that is an underpainting, also known as dead coloring, doodverf in Dutch. Uh, and then you get the actual paint layers with the highlights and the varnishes. A painting is not a two-dimensional object. That's basically what I'm trying to, uh, uh, to teach my students. And we use different uh, methods of examination to look at those different uh, uh, substrates of, of a painting um, because they give us information about these different layers. X-rays, of course, have the potential power to go straight through the entire package, or I often use the image of a lasagna for my students, which, which kind of works. Um, infrared uh, will be absorbed by the underdrawing and will therefore be able to reveal uh, that kind of drawing also if it's covered by paint. And of course UV will, uh, has much m less penetrating power but it will reveal uh, changes in, in varnish, etc. The human eye is a very good tool as well. Um, and we, we can see, uh, we can actually see the smallest differences in tones and colors in use as long as we see them side, and side by side. And I'll give you an example about that later. We, our human sight is actually much less capable of remembering uh, um, differences in, in tone and color. All right, this was the only static slide I, I will want to use today because I want to... Um, go live to the internet now, if everything works, and go to the uh, Closer to Van Eyck uh, website. This is uh, relatively old work. It is, uh, this went live in, I believe it was 2011 or 2012. Um, this project was started uh, in 2010 when the, there, were, there were clear signals that the Ghent altarpiece was not in a good shape. Um, for you, you, the people among you who don't know the, um, the Ghent altarpiece, it is an absolutely monumental uh, polyptic. Um, it consists of, or originally it consisted of 12 panels, uh, wings that close over a central uh, section. 
I believe it's not, it's, it looks a bit squished actually. It's even wider uh, relative to its height than it shows here. Um, but it's, it's absolutely monumental. It's 11 feet high. So it's, it's actually bigger than uh, on the screen here. The panel was, um, was living in a glass case um, in which it was placed uh, since, the, uh, since the 70s or the early 80s. And um, the, the, climate, the climatological conditions in that box were far from ideal. Um, and especially the copy, the, there's a panel was stolen. Uh, the, the material history of this of this altarpiece is uh, is quite horrific when you read it. Indeed, it's all very well published. I won't go into this today, but it was stolen. It was robbed. It was uh, brought uh, to the Louvre, the center panels. It was in the salt mine uh, during the Nazi era. It was uh, it, had, it has had a, a very uh, dramatic past. And one of the panels was was uh, stolen. The panel of the just judges. And uh, the paint, the, a copy was painted, and, and that copy was actually starting to uh, to tend and to flake, and it was obviously that uh, the conditions were not favorable uh, to keep. So in 2010, it was decided to have a preliminary examination in situ in the chapel uh, in the church of Saint Bavo, where it resides, and um, where, uh, during which we did, we were able to do a documentation, quite a, a large documentation campaign. Uh, of the uh, altarpiece. Um, every panel, it was disassembled, every panel was examined by uh, uh, conservators to see if a full restoration was warranted. And that indeed turned out to be the case, but at the time we didn't know that yet. Um, so it was also, it was possible that if the decision was that we wouldn't have to restore it, that this would be the last uh, possibility to document it, uh, to fully document it for quite a while. So we, um, we documented the hell out of it if, uh, <laughs> when we had the chance. Um, coming to this from art history, and of course art history is a, is, a, uh, is a field, a discipline, where the comparison of images is critical. Um, normally what we, what we do in art history is have two slides side by side. Nowadays, you put two images within a PowerPoint slide, but you, you, you compare two images. In technical art history, it is wonderfully advantageous if you can compare more images, and especially if you can, com can compare images not only side by side, but also um, on top of each other or uh, in a layered fashion, superimposed. All right. Uh, the, you've been looking at the open altarpiece. Uh, of course, the, uh, when the altarpiece is closed, it looks like this. Uh, at the moment, the first restoration uh, campaign is underway on the exterior panels. Uh, it turned out that 60% of the surface of the exterior, 60, 60% of the exterior has been overpainted, uh, which goes back the overpaintings go back all the way to the 17th century, and some might even be earlier. Um, these, where we can safely remove them, they are being removed, and the result is absolutely spectacular. Um, the, it turns, it, it, we had initial uh, examination done of the interior as well, and it seems that the similar kind of overpaintings are present there as well. So, but this is, I'm not going to talk about the restoration, but, but that, what I'm going to want to show you is how we can use the internet uh, to, uh, to communicate these findings and to, uh, to actually, how we can create uh, uh, or present this as a research tool. And that's really what it, um, what it has become. So when we go, uh, each of these panels, you can click on any of these panels. Um, I'll start with, the, with simply zooming in and show you what kind of, well, first of all, what kind of mastery. Um, let me see if I can lower the lights a little bit. Um, a bit further. You can see the incredible painterly mastery of, of Van Eyck uh, in, for instance, in the, uh, the embroideries that he, um, he painted with, um, with gold paint and, and letting yellow. You also... Uh, small detail here of this brooch uh, of this angel 
um, if I zoom out one step, um, you can also, what I find absolutely fascinating, he must have, he had incredible observational skills. He not only noticed that uh, light um, falls on these pearls uh, in, a, in a very consistent way, he also sees that the light uh, gets diffused within the pearl, uh, on the back of the pearl, uh, in a very similar, uh, similar way. The light comes from the same direction. You probably noticed that very consistently. You might uh, recognize, uh, or perhaps not, but let me show you this little detail. This, so this is reflected in this blue uh, stone. What you see here is the reflection of the actual window in the Veit Chapel, the original location of the, uh, of the altarpiece. And you see a, a stained glass window. Uh, you, can, you can actually see how when I painted this, there's this blue font in which there's a whitish scumble and then with a hard, sharp object, he, he uh, pulls the white paint away. Um, absolutely wonderful. Um, talk about eye candy. Huh? Um, one of the great things about the website is that you can combine uh, different images, uh, um, different, um, for instance, uh, the entire altarpiece was also documented with infrared macro photography uh, using the same camera as for visible light, of which the infrared blocker was removed. So you have the, uh, the same resolution. Um, these images are then, um, you lock them uh, in the zoom. Uh, so when you zoom one image, when you zoom in on one image, you can also zoom in the other or zoom out. You can also unclick these, you can unlock them. Uh, you can also combine images from other panels to, to compare. Um, <coughs> infrared reflectography is an important tool for uh, art historians because it, it shows the, as I mentioned, the initial drawing, the initial design drawing um, um, that's under the paint. In this case, These angels, you, you, we actually noticed a, a striking difference between the underdrawing of the angel on the right, if you then, which is very elaborate and, and uh, with very dense hatching. Uh, but then, if you go to the other faces, there's much less preparation of the of the of these faces. Um, in case of the Ghent altarpiece, there's a very big question. You probably all know it was painted or it was finished in 1432. There's an inscription on the outer frames that says it was started by uh, Hubert van Eyck and finished by Jan van Eyck. So there's always a big question in the literature, who of the two brothers painted what? And uh, so the big, uh, the big question is where, if, if Hubert's hand is still there, where can we find it? So we've been also looking for uh, differences in underdrawing in the different panels. Um, Okay, let me. So the, uh, one of the great aspects um, of this website is that, uh, is the use of social media, in that if I, um, oh, use the, it doesn't want to do what I want it to do. Normally, <laughs> normally when you um, click on this, you get an email function. And you can make a breadcrumb function so you can use it in your teaching. <coughs> or you can create a whole series of breadcrumbs of these locations in the website. It's linked to the URLs of where you are. So if you, um, I'll try it one more time. No, it really won't. Don't know what it is. It might be a resolution issue here. I've never had a malfunction, malfunction before. But so what you can do is uh, email directly, to f type in a, uh, an address of a, of, a, uh, of a colleague and say, look what I found here. What do you think? You don't have to describe where to go. You can actually send the URL also of the combination of images. OK. Um, one of our most. Uh, 
a most dense user group. And we've been, we've, of course, we've been monitoring uh, the use of the site and the visits to the site. And uh, I was actually getting a little bit concerned because there's a group of over, thousand, uh, over a thousand unique visitors who've been uh, visiting the site um, 5,000 times or more. And we were joking that we might start a user group for this, uh, for this group of users to, uh, to get rid of their addiction. But, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's really been uh, wonderful to see that there's, it's really been used as a research tool. It's not, we also have a lot of visitors. Uh, we found that, that several visitors did not go beyond uh, the eye candy and, and zoom in in one panel and then actually leave. But we also found that we had a, 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 a very, uh, yeah, a very um, faithful group of um, followers. It's been incredibly useful, the website, in the restoration itself. And that's been uh, tremendously, it, 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 this must be the best pre-treatment uh, pre documentation that you can imagine. We will build onto the site uh, during the restoration in three uh, campaigns. We will, um, we'll, the exterior will be finished in, hopefully in a, in a year from now. Then we will move on to the, uh, to the interior panels. And we will, um, the, the other aspect that I am very uh, uh, proud of in this, uh, in this uh, web application is that we are uh, we included all the reports uh, from the conservators? It's a very open access, uh, ideal um, or open access to information. Uh, also, yeah, about the uh, there's, there's there's dendrochronology reports, there's um, the preliminary report reports, and there's the actual uh, restoration reports will be included. Um, let me. How am I doing for time? Let me move on to the, uh, the Bosch uh, material. In, uh, in February of this year, a major exhibition on uh, Euronymous Bosch will, um, will open in the town of Sertogenbos in, in Holland. Uh, the town of Sertogenbos, uh, it will be in the, in the North Brabant Museum. It's a, it's a relatively small museum which doesn't hold any Bosch paintings themselves. Uh, you can imagine that that's a difficult exhibition, uh, exhibition to, uh, to organize uh, if that's your point of departure. The city of Den Bosch very wisely uh, realized that to, uh, to make this project succeed, um, it's really important to create a a broad and an ambitious research project in which uh, for the very, very first time in history, uh, without exaggeration, um, an attempt is made to document uh, an entire oeuvre of one artist in a standardized fashion. Uh, for scientists, this, you will raise your eyebrows and say, that, that's not been done. Uh, it's not rocket science, but it has not been done. And uh, so we traveled the world. Uh, every museum that allowed, that gave us access to these paintings, and there were only uh, two or three museums where we did not get access um, for different, for a variety of reasons. But we, uh, we documented a very large number of paintings, always in the same, with the same equipment, the same procedures, the same lights, the same cameras, the same uh, resolutions. Uh, we documented in visible light, high resolution visible light, high resolution infrared, uh, infrared reflectography, and if x-rays were available, we uh, photographed those in the same way as we did uh, the visible light and the infrared. Um, we developed new uh, equipment, such as a window frame to let cameras move uh, in the, uh, at the same distance uh, of the paintings all the time. Very uh, low-tech, because uh, we had to be able to travel with it. But let me show you an example. These are, this is our research website. The images are so large. Uh, we, we took um, image, yeah, photographs of every 10 by 15 centimeters on the surface with a 60 megapixel camera. 
those images were then all stitched and registered uh, by Rob Erdman, who created a wonderful digital infrastructure for this project. And I just want to show you uh, one example. Uh, that's a painting in Washington in the National Gallery, The Death and the Miser. Um, you see a, a man on his deathbed. Um, the iconography of the scene is, is, is uh, ambiguous. Uh, here's the man on his deathbed. It's unclear who this man is, if it's perhaps the same man in an earlier state of his life who's hoarding money. Death is entering uh, the door. An, an angel is uh, helping our, our dying friend, and uh, he's pointing to the a crucifix in the, uh, in the window. A little devil is, is, uh, is at the foreground, and it has been suggested that that might be a self-portrait. Just to show you, the, again, the kind of resolution that we can play with here is, uh, is really quite astonishing. Okay, um, so this is the, 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 um, the single image, as it were, the invisible light. Same way you can, you can look at an infrared and infrared reflectography. Um, but Rob Ertman developed a number of new viewers uh, for this project, which are important, I think, for the future. In that, uh, I mentioned already that the human eye is, uh, is very good in, organ in seeing differences but it is not so uh, strong in, um, in memory. Um, you, you can see, when you see these images side by side, you see that there's differences. Huh? This, this, this little monster was underdrawn with an open mouth, for instance. Uh, the dying man has a big goblet uh, in his hand, which was never painted. Um, but the viewer that Ertman made, which is, I think, best equipped or best suited for our work, is the um, is the so-called. Let me close a few windows. It's the so-called curtain viewer, and in this curtain viewer, you can actually uh, interactively, immediately. Uh, go to these different uh, modalities. And then if you look at the face of the miser, uh, you, actually, you see that his mouth was also uh, open in the underdrawing, just like the little monster. Yeah, you, and you see that here the problem of memory is, is gone. Yeah, you, you can literally immediately compare these different images. I find this uh, fascinating because from an iconographical art historical point of view, uh, it appears that the ambiguity was actually even bigger in the, in the initial stages because it appears with the, these open mouths and, the, and this expensive goblet in his hand, it appears that he's trying to bribe death or he's trying to buy more uh, time uh, before death will actually uh, win in the end. Also, look at the the, ba the bag of this bag in uh, that the monster that both the, the sorry in in the in the underdrawing the man is still holding this bag eh, his, with his hand in the painting his his hand is removed it is withdrawn from that bag. But the question still remains: is if the, is this monster giving him uh, this money or is he handing uh, the money to this monster? So the ambiguity was even larger in the initial. Uh, uh, composition than in the final composition. This is just one example out of uh, you know, 10 terabytes of data uh, that we now have on Bosch. Uh, the Bosch oeuvre has been uh, widely discussed, especially in regards to attribution. It's, very, uh, it's a very difficult issue. Difficult, uh, there's very big issues if, if this is part of the oeuvre or not. Um, I won't get into this uh, right now, but we are fully uh, convinced that this new uh, web application, which will be online for all of you to visit in February, uh, will also be used as a uh, as a research tool, uh, not just by us, but uh, for the entire field. So, thank you very much. <laughs>